Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be part of the SK Dhammalingam lecture series. And this morning, I will be speaking about interventional radiology, an overview, and its role in the management of cancer in general. So the scope of my presentation is to provide you an overview of what the field of interventional radiology is about, some of the techniques, procedures in interventional radiology, the use of interventional radiology within the therapeutic landscape, and interventional radiology and its role in the management of cancer in general. For those of you who are interested, you can visit my website, Interventional Oncology Services, where I provide uh, information in depth about oncologic interventions, other interventions, and also specifically about women's interventions. Before we go on any further, I'd like to make some points to set the background in which the interventional radiology fits in. And the first is cancer care is a continuum, which starts with cancer prevention, cancer screening, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship and recovery and end of life care. And this whole process involves psychosocial and palliative care. And more importantly, it requires targeted navigation based on the need of each individual patient. And along this pathway, there would be a need for distress screening to make sure that the patients who go through this cancer care are adequately looked after. If one then looks at the complexity of the cancer care continuum, there are numerous points where failures occur. Failures could occur in risk assessment, in primary prevention, in diagnosis, in recurrent surveillance, as well as end of life care. And therefore, it is important that there is coordinated care. And this takes the form of what are called multidisciplinary tumor boards, where a variety of different specialities, in this case, the patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, will have the liver transplant program and the hepatobiliary surgeons on board, the gastroenterologists and the hepatologists, as well as the medical oncologists and the pathologists, and interventional radiology and radiologists also sit on this. The final point I'd like to make is disease management and palliative care are often seen as two separate distinct entities with cure and control in the initial stages with survivorship and hospice in the end. Rather, disease management and palliative care should be seen as a bow tie with an increased role of cure and control in the initial early stages with great emphasis on survivorship and hospice towards the later stages of disease. It is also important for us to remember that our job in medicine is not just to ensure health and survival, but to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reason one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when disability comes, but all along the way. And interventional radiology has a role to play in ensuring well-being. So let's move on to looking at what interventional radiology has to offer and it will encompass interventional radiology and its role in management of cancer and I thought it, the best way to illustrate this was to follow a patient who comes in with cough and chest pain who has a chest radiograph and finds a mass in the right upper lobe for which he has a CT scan, which clearly identifies the mass, but we don't know what the histology of this mass is because the possible causes of mass can be numerous, could be benign lung tumors, could be lung cancer, could be lung abscess, could be lipoid pneumonias, for which we would probably need to do a lung biopsy. And so what happens is, this is the CT scanner, and you have the patient in the scanner, with an image on the monitor and the radiologist is putting the needle in to get a specimen of the tissue. So here is how the images look like. This is the CT scan, this is the right, this is the left. Here is the mass. And you can see there's a needle being put in through the chest wall. It 
comes close to the tumor for which you have taken a biopsy. When one looks at the types of biopsies and techniques, there are generally two different kinds. One is the core needle biopsy, for which you have a needle which has got a thruff, for which you can take a significant amount of cells in here, compared to fine needle aspiration cytology, where you use very fine needles and you get cells. These are the kind of tissue samples you would get with a core biopsy, which will tell you structure as well as being able to make a diagnosis in some benign conditions which FNA is not able to do. This is the kind of results you get, and this is a case, patient with a adenocarcinoma of the lung. Now, when you look at core biopsies, accuracies vary between 80 to 95 percent. Negative predictive values are very high, between 84 to 96 percent, with a low false negative rate of between 2 to 4 percent. When one looks at venous access in patients who receive chemotherapy, there are still a significant proportion of patients who receive chemotherapy via a peripheral line in the arm or hand, of which 60% are unable to complete that chemotherapy. And of these patients, more than half eventually end up having to have a vascular access put in. The first form of venous access is a peripherally inserted central venous catheter, which is inserted into a peripheral vein, usually in the upper arm, the tip of which ends up in the right atrium. This is how the big catheter looks like. This is how it is placed. And this is how the x-ray looks like with a catheter from the arm lying in the right atrium. So what are the benefits of catheters for cancer treatment? They can stay in place for weeks or months, reduce the number of times a nurse or any other team member needs to insert a needle into your vein, reduce the need for needle pricks in patients who have small or damaged veins who are afraid of needles, give blood transfusions on more than one treatment at a time because these catheters have double lumens, it reduces the risk of drugs leaking out into your skin. Additionally, it avoids bruising or bleeding if you have bleeding problems in patients who have low platelet counts, especially those on chemotherapy. And it lets you have some kinds of chemotherapy at home where you can have continuous infusion therapies through small pumps that you may carry. The other option is chemopots. And these are pots which are placed under the skin in your chest. The tube which then runs into your superior vena cava and lying just at your right atrium. And you have special needles which then access your pot, which then allows blood to be drawn or chemo to be infused. So here's an example of a patient with a pot. This is the catheter that goes into the skin uh, through the SVC to lie in the right atrium. And there are people who have taken these pots and created some really nice jewelry. So what are the benefits of pots for cancer treatment? Pots can remain in place for weeks or months or years. Again, as for your picks, it reduces the number of needle pricks. You can use it to give treatments that last longer than a day. The needle can stay in the pot for several days. You can give more than one medication at a time to a double pot and you can do blood tests and give chemotherapy through the same access. Unfortunately, if these pots are left for a long period of time, they can break. So here's an example of a pot we just put in. This is the pot, this is the catheter in the right atrium, and several years down the line, the catheter is broken and the tip is lying within the IVC within the hepatic vein. And to retrieve this, you can go in through the inferior vena cava up in, right through the heart. You can snare this and take this out. So if you have a pot which is no longer necessary, it is probably a good idea for you to take it out or monitor this because it can break and dislodge. One of the common complications of malignancy is fluid within the pleural cavity. So you will have fluid which is built up in the pleural cavity, which is compressing your lung. 
and this may cause you to have difficulty in breathing and this is what the chest x-ray looks like this is all fluid within the right pleural cavity for which you put a tube and you drain the fluid so this is what a pigtail catheter looks like it's put into the pleural cavity and the fluid within this right pleural cavity is no longer visible and this is the tube itself and this is how you aspirate the pleural effusion uh, it can then be treated with pleural disease to reduce the risk of the recurrence of the effusion the next common complication is deep vein thrombosis where clots develop within the veins of the leg and thigh which then break away and end up in the lungs as pulmonary emboli what do clots look like on the CT scan? Here's an example of a patient who has clots in the palmary artery, the black areas, with a patent palmary artery with white contrast media. This is what the clots look like once they have been surgically removed. Palmary embolism carries a high mortality. In those patients who have poor cardiac reserve, Metallic devices called inferior vena cava filters are inserted into the inferior vena cava to trap the thrombus which is going to embolize into the pulmonary arteries. So filters can be inserted either from the inferior vena cava or from the superior vena cava and this is what the filters look like once they have been deployed. There are so many different kinds of filters on the market. Uh, all with the simple idea of trapping the thrombi within the struts of the filter to reduce the risk of severe PE. It must be remembered that IBC filters do come with complications and these complications include migration, breakage, where the filter struts break through. I will show you an example of this. It can perforate through the walls of the inferior vena cava and damage adjacent organs. And IVC filters are also prone to thrombosis. Here's an example of a patient who had an IVC filter where the struts have broken and are lying in the pulmonary artery for which they were able to snare this piece of material out from the palmary arteries before it perforated or caused thrombosis. So IVC filters should not be left longer than they are necessary and it is currently recommended that IVC filters should be removed as soon as adequate anticoagulation and risk of PE is overcome. This is an example of how an IVC filter can be retrieved. So this is the IVC filter you insert a wire you capture this and you snare this and the filter can be removed and no longer lie in place and increase the risk of unnecessary complications so what makes interventional radiology possible the keystone of which is visualization here is an example of a patient with a small renal tumor in the left side and under CT guidance that tumor was identified and a microwave needle was inserted the tumor was burnt and this patient was able to carry on without the need for any major surgery our next common mode of visualization is ultrasound here is an example of a patient with a large pelvic abscess under ultrasound guidance, the needle is inserted into this abscess, followed by the insertion of a pigtail catheter, which you can see on the x-ray. And this pelvic abscess resolved, and the patient was able to recover without the need for any major surgery. Angiography is the other tool we use very frequently. Here's an example of a patient with a bleeding peptic ulcer. And you can see on the CT scan the area of bleeding. So what we have done is we've gone through the gastroduodenal artery and we are able to identify the site of bleeding. 
and we are able to block that off by the injection of some glue. Rarely MR is used because of the complexity that is involved, but here's an example of, an, of a treatment of a uterine fibroid using focus ultrasound. This is the transducer, which is used to focus ultrasound to treat this fibroid. And these are your pre-treatment images, which show the fibroid. This is your post-treatment, which showed that the fibroid has been completely devascularized. What were the other tools? Needles, we use lots and lots of needles, uh, different kinds of needles, but Shiva needles is what we use quite a bit now. This allows us to gain access into the various structures that are necessary. We use wires, lots of different wires in terms of shapes, lengths, diameters. We also have catheters with a variety of different shapes for different purposes so that we are able to guide our wires to get into the necessary vessels or structures we need to then perform the necessary treatments. Balloons and angioplasty. So if you have a vessel which is narrowed, you put a balloon across this, you blow up the balloon, and you are able to recanalize areas of stenosis within the blood vessels, within the bile ducts, within the ureters, uh, and other structures. However, if the plaques or stenosis are eccentric, then using a balloon is not going to be able to keep the lumen of the angioplastic structures patent, in which case metallic stents have to be deployed. And these stents can either be plastic, they can be uncovered metal stents, fully covered metal stents, or partially covered metal stents. And the choice of the stent depends on the area needed to be treated. The same principles used for pleural drainage can be used in the biliary tree. Here's an example of a patient who's got a tumor in the distal common bile duct. And through the left duct, the pigtail catheter has been inserted. And metallic stents can be inserted. Here's another patient who has got bilateral biliary drainage catheters through which a left and right metallic stent has been inserted. Other configurations of metallic stenting of the biliary duct are also possible. Through the access of the biliary duct system, biopsy forceps can be used to try and get tissue for confirmation of the disease process. Now, looking at other areas in which interventional radiology has a role to play is that of chemoembolization. And so what happens is catheters are placed into the vessel as close to the tumor as possible, into which drug eluding beads or other forms of chemicals are inserted to try and kill the tumor. So here is an example of a patient with a large tumor in the right lobe of the liver and through a catheter placed in the right hepatic artery the tumor has been embolized using lipidol laden with chemotherapy. There are a variety of commercially available particles of different sizes, different chemical compositions onto which a variety of different chemotherapeutic agents can be attached. Some of these particles are permanent particles while other particles are biodegradable. If one looks at the amount of drug released into the arterial venous circulation over time, conventional taste releases significant amount of chemotherapeutic agent into the systemic circulation compared to that of drug eluding beads Consequently, the systemic toxicities of conventional taste are much, much higher than that of drug eluding beads, though the long-term outcomes of conventional taste compared to that of drug eluding beads are quite similar. What about ablative therapies? 
generally there are two modalities of treatment radio frequency and microwave both have different forms of action generally it is now considered that microwave ablation has a more uniform heating and it can be used to treat the liver thyroids kidney and even breast what about other forms of arterial therapies this is the use of selective internal radiation therapy using yttrium which is placed on particles and this is delivered in the same way that is used for chemoembolization though the process of planning and delivery is more complicated we will talk more about this in the next lecture the other minimally invasive way of treating tumors is the use of what is called iodine seed brachytherapy uh, these are very fine pellets of radiation on silver wires which are implanted into areas of tumor under CT guidance and this is increasingly seen as an option for those patients who don't respond to conventional chemotherapy or radiotherapy or who are not amenable to any kind of ablative therapy. What about other techniques and procedures in interventional radiology? Uterine artery embolization is a way to treat uterine fibroids or adenomyosis. And here is a patient with a large intramural posterior wall fibroid. And uterine artery embolization involves inserting a catheter into the uterine artery and delivering embolic agents to block blood supply to this fibroid. And this is how it looks like in this patient. They have inserted catheters into both the uterine arteries. This is what the feeder arteries in the uterus with the fibroid is pre-embolization. And this is what the post-embolization images look like. What about outcomes? So this, as I showed earlier, is a submucosal fibroid, which is embolized. And you can see six to nine months down the road, this fibroid has more or less completely disappeared. What about varicose veins? Varicose veins are a very, very common problem. You can result in areas of ulceration. You can have, you know, tortuous deforming veins in the legs. So what do we do for this? We insert a laser fiber from the ankle. We then deliver the energy. It ablates the inner lining of the varicose veins. The catheter is slowly pulled and the varicose vein then occludes. What do the images look like pre and post? So here's an example of a patient with pre and you can see varicosities as well as spider veins. And post treatment, these veins have shown significant regression. Just to complete the uh, discussion on the role of interventional radiology in other areas, cerebral coiling. And so if you had, this is your blood vessel and you have what is called an aneurysm, which can bleed and cause significant morbidity as well as mortality. The conventional way was to go and put a clip across this. Now increasingly, they're using coils to go in and block off these aneurysms. And in, in certain instances, when the, wide, the neck is wide, they will put in uh, stents through which they then deploy coils, or they have what we call flow diverters, which isolate these aneurysms and these patients do well without the risk, the morbidity and the mortality that is associated with some of this location of aneurysm. So here's an example of a patient. This is the right vertebral artery. This is the left vertebral artery. And so what they have done is they have gone through the right vertebral artery to protect the vertebral artery. And they have then used coils to block off the aneurysm so that this patient is able to function normally with minimal risk of this aneurysm rupturing. 
The other area in which interventional radiology is significantly involved is that of cerebral AVMs. And you have a patient here who has got a bleed in the brain, this white area within the brain. And there's also areas of tortuous vessels seen within this part of the brain. And so they've gone and through this internal carotid artery, put a microcatheter, inject some glue. This is pre and this is post. And you can see this is the glue that is blocked of the nidus. This is the nidus of the arterial venous malformation. And this is what the final outcome is post embolization of an arterial venous malformation. So what are the benefits of interventional radiology? Generally, as I have already illustrated, this is a minimally invasive procedure with no major incisions. We use very small access points, either through the skin or through the blood vessels to get to the areas that we want. And this is possible because we have good visualization, good tools like wires and catheters as well as needles. There is minimal scarring as the access points are very, very small. Recovery times are very good, fast recoveries. Most patients come in for procedures with an overnight stay and increasingly due to the cost involved in admissions, more and more centers are performing these procedures as daycare procedures without the need for any overnight stay. And because these procedures are minimally invasive with no incisions, there is significantly less pain in the post-procedure recovery time. And there is reduced risk involved because these patients are monitored through imaging as well as using proper and adequate imaging guidance outcomes are much, much better at much lower cost. A part of interventional radiology, which is now coming onto the fore, is interventional oncology. And this is a new speciality within interventional radiology, which looks at how interventional radiology can contribute to better outcomes with less risk and less morbidity in patients with uh, cancers. And we will talk more about this in the next lecture where we will focus on transarterial embolization of the liver, transarterial chemoembolization, radioembolization, as well as ablative procedures like RFA, microwave, cryotherapy in helping control and treat some of the consequences of cancer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. In this lecture, I will be trying to share with you the options of cancer management in terms of interventional radiology. I think it is more appropriate for us to look at it from the point of view of interventional oncology. Traditionally, there are three main ways to treat cancer. There's surgery, there's radiotherapy, and there's chemotherapy. What we can now offer is a fourth way to treat cancer. This is interventional oncology. If you like, this is the fourth pillar of cancer care. The different ways that we can do this are we can do this with percutaneous ablation so we can put a small needle through the skin with image guidance using either ultrasound, CT or an MRI scanner to locate the needle directly into the tumour. And once the needle's in the tumour we can either heat the tumour up with radio frequency energy or with microwave energy or we can freeze the tumour and these are ways of killing the tumour cells locally without affecting the surrounding tissues in a detrimental way. So the rest of the kidney, or the rest of the liver, is left normal. 
and that way the patient maintains the function of that organ and they've got minimum amount of side effects from the treatment. The other type of interventional oncology treatments are known as intra-arterial therapies. These are minimally invasive treatments carried out by an interventional radiologist. They tend to be focused on treating liver tumours and are most commonly done with a local anaesthetic through a tiny access in the groin. Through this small catheter placed in the tumour artery, tiny beads can be injected. And these beads serve two purposes. They can block the blood supply to the tumour and they can also seed the tumour either with chemotherapy which is the case with TACE treatment, which is known as transarterial chemoembolization, or with radiotherapy beads in the CERT treatments, which is selective internal radiation therapy. And these will have a very local effect. They won't affect the whole patient or the whole organ. They'll just affect the tumor itself and kill the cancer cells directly. And after a few days, that radioactivity has, has died off, and there should be minimal side effects from this treatment. To recap, interventional oncology treatments involve ablation or intra-arterial therapies to treat cancer. They are minimally invasive, highly targeted therapies carried out by interventional radiologists. They have now become well-established treatments, helping make interventional oncology the fourth pillar of cancer care. As well illustrated in the previous video, optimal multidisciplinary care of cancer is now based on four pillars, radiation oncology, medical oncology, surgical oncology, and interventional oncology or interventional radiology. I will attempt to show the pathways available for patients with liver cancer who may benefit from interventional oncology. So this is the scope of my talk. Among the five most common cancers in the population for peninsular Malaysia, liver cancer is number five. When one looks at the types of primary liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC, is the most common liver cancer, accounting for approximately 90% of all liver cancers. It forms in the hepatocytes, which make up the majority of the liver cells. The second most common liver cancer is intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which accounts between 10 to 15% of all cases, and this begins in the cells that line the small bile ducts within the liver. Hemangioendotheliomas and hepatic angiosarcomas, as well as hepatoblastomas, are the other rare tumors that occur in the liver. As regards risk factors, hepatitis B and hepatitis C are common risk factors, followed by fatty liver disease, alcohol consumption, metabolic diseases, and several other environmental factors. If you look at cirrhosis and HCC, one third of all patients with liver cirrhosis will develop HCC during their lifetime, and one to eight percent or people with cirrhosis develop HCC per year. And 90% of HCC cases in the Western countries have a cirrhotic background. The liver is divided into eight segments, starting from segment one as the caudate lobe, segment two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And these segments are defined by the left hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein as well as the right hepatic vein and branches of the portal vein which is in blue with a right branch and a left branch. If one looks at the diagnosis of early HCC curative treatments from 1980 to 2020, the number of early HCC curative treatments have increased from 5 to 10% to approximately 40 to 60 percent. What are the potential curative treatments? This include liver transplantation, hepatic resection, and local regional ablative interventions. 
if the patients are unable to meet the transplant criteria because they are unresectable, they can be downstaged using a juvenile or preoperative local regional therapy. And if this is successful and they have a resectable HCC or HCC within the liver transplant criteria, they can proceed on to resection with or without the need for new adjuvant therapy to reduce recurrence. Otherwise, they can go on to the liver transplant wait list. And if there is no disease progression and they are still within the Milan criteria, they proceed on to liver transplant. However, should there be a disease progression while on the liver transplant wait list, they undergo what is called bridging therapy, which is preoperative local regional therapy which if successful then allows them to go on to liver transplant however if this is unsuccessful with tumor progression they drop out and they may then be offered palliative treatments like taste sorafenib radionormalization or any kind of radiotherapy if the downstaging at the initial stages is unable to downstage this disease and they are unsuccessful they proceed on to palliative treatments, as I mentioned previously, like taste, sorafenib, radioembolization, or radiotherapy. When one looks at the local regional treatment strategies for HCC, you have radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, transarterial chemoembolization, uterine 90 selective internal radiation therapy, and stereotactic beam radiotherapy. Now, if one looks at radiofrequency ablation, generally recommended for tumors less than two to three centimeters and tumors not in a subcapsular or perivascular location or adjacent to the gallbladder or diaphragm because this increases the risk of complications. Generally, there is a much lower rate of serious events compared to liver resection. And more importantly, it is tissue sparing and it is a very extensively studied ablation technique with broad clinical appearances. However, it has got reduced efficiency when HCC is in a subcapsular, perivascular, or adjacent to the gallbladder or diaphragm or greater than 3 cm and has a higher cancer-related mortality compared to liver resection. What about microwave ablation? Microwave ablation is similar to radiofrequency in its profile. However, it is effective in tumors up to five centimeters because it is less susceptible to heat sink and has a short, shorter duration of therapy compared to RFA. And as mentioned, it is efficient in tumor volumes up to five centimeters. And this can be extended by the use of multiple probes two or three, and which gives you ablations of between eight to nine centimeters. However, this treatment effect varies between the different devices. With regard to transarterial chemoembolization, this can be done with doxorubicin or cisplatin attached to either drug eluting beads or lipidol, or this can be done with lipidol and ethanol or just plain lipidol. This is generally a palliative indication for patients with BCLCB and such segmental taste, very selective in those patients who have worse liver function because you want to try and spare as much of the normal liver as you possibly can because these patients are generally cirrhotic. There is a high incidence of post embolization syndrome adjacent to the gallbladder. This has been extensively studied and its safety has been proven. However, because this is generally used in more extensive tumors, it has a local tumor recurrence higher than that of liver resection, resection or RFA. There is an elevated risk of liver failure in cases of those with Charles pube B and C and, and those with port vein thrombosis. And post embolization syndrome can be decreased by the use of dexamethasone. Yttrium 90 is indicated in patients from anywhere from BCLCA to C. Importantly, it is applicable in the presence of port vein thrombosis, which is a very, very useful 
2 is got a favorable toxicity in comparison to that of sorafenib that is less clinical experience than that with taste the major limitation of yttrium 90 is the cost in malaysia it costs approximately between 85 to 100000 per treatment Cerotractic beam radiotherapy gives you excellent local control applicable to large tumors however there is an elevated risk of liver toxicity with regards to ire percutaneous ethanol ablation and the hyphu these generally do not play a significant role in the management of hcc with regard to the use of targeted systemic treatments in hcc uh, for stage b stage c with portal vein involvement or those with diffuse metastatic disease and you have first line agents like sorafenib and levitinib second line agents and numerous clinical trials ongoing of the role of systemic therapy in the management of hcc as i mentioned previously plants arterial chemotherapies include chemoembolization which is doxorubicin or cisplatin with lipodol bland embolization of just lipodol Transarterial ethanol lipodol embolization, radio embolization using sersphere or yttrium, and transarterial chemotherapy infusion. The goal of transarterial chemotherapy is to deliver cytotoxic doses directly to the tumor, sparing normal liver tissue and limiting systemic toxicity. As I mentioned, the variety of embolic agents have been used, and generally, gelatin sponges have been used to block off the arterial supply at the end of the chemoembolization. However, synthetic microspheres have been used to try and bind the chemotherapeutic agents better and have less systemic toxicities. Patient selection for any of the transarterial therapies are similar with a good performance status, ECOP of less than two, acceptable liver function, child puke B less than eight typically. Now, if you look at the particles, the smaller and more compressible particles include tumor vascularity at the level of the distal arterial capillaries, which is 100 to 300 microns. And these are used for more effective embolization with minimal risk of non-target ischemic complications. Now, the larger particles will occlude more proximally. This is better in patients who have large arterial venous shunts. However, the side effect is that you may have more global ischemia. This is well illustrated where you have particles which are 500 microns and the smallest being 35 microns. And you can see that the 35 micron particles are very distally embolized compared to the more proximal uh, larger particles and therefore having a lower distribution uh, in the treatment of HCC. As I mentioned, conventional taste, doxorubicin plus lipodol, and it's mixed, you know, like this. Then you have this drug eluding beads, to which you, you bind doxorubicin, and some of these new particles are now radio opaque. So what's the advantage of drug eluding beads compared to conventional taste? And if you look at the plasma doxorubicin concentration over time, you will find that if you use conventional taste, which is lipodol with doxorubicin or cisplatin, you have a much higher level of plasma doxorubicin compared to what you would get when you use drug eluding beads because the binding of the doxorubicin to these particles is much more efficient. So here is a uh, schemata of the treatment, which is the hepatic artery, the feeder. This is the tumor, and this is the portal vein that is draining the tumor. So you will have your doxorubicin with your particles either in lipidol, and this will stain and block off your feeders and also go into the tumor and block off some of the portal vein drain. Here is an illustration. This is a catheter within the hepatic artery. 
and this are your normal vessels within the liver. You have abnormal vasculature here, one tumor, and you have a large tumor here with large draining veins. And using a microcatheter, this tumor is treated with ethanol lipidol or lipidol with a toxorubicin or cisplatin until there is complete stasis and the followed by injection of some gel foam to reduce arterial supply. What does the outcome look like? And so here is the post procedure MR and you can see that there is areas of viable tumor here which may require a subsequent treatment four to six weeks provided there is no liver decompensation. What are the indications for drug eluding beads depth haze? Again, for intermediate stage patients, ECLCB. Patients indicated for curative treatments but not eligible. Disease recurrence after curative treatment. Extending periods during which patients fulfill criteria for liver transplantation. Downstaging disease to fill, fulfill criteria for liver transplantation. Contraindications, absolute contraindications, decompensated baseline liver function, extensive tumor involvement, both lobes of liver, the infiltrative type of HCC, untreatable arteriovenous fistulas, contraindications to the chemotherapeutic drug or renal insufficiency, relative contraindications or tumor size of 10 centimeters, and this can be overcome by the use of uh, partial treatments over extended periods of time, comorbidities involving compromised organ function, untreated varices are high risk of bleeding, bile duct obstruction or incompetent papilla increases the risk of developing abscesses or infections. What about selective internal radiation therapy? Uh, these are the particles of yttrium and what happens is similar to what is done in conventional taste the catheter is placed into the artery feeding the, the tumors and they have a special delivery system to reduce the risk of radiation to the operator and once the radiation is delivered scans are done to determine the location and the dose that is delivered uh, to the areas of the tumor so here is an example of a tumor which is 6.4 centimeters prior to treatment. The patient had a yttrium therapy and follow-up shows that there was almost complete necrosis of the tumor with excellent response. Just to mention, well, what is the role of uh, yttrium or cirsphias in metastatic colorectal carcinomas? So if you have potentially, uh, you know, tumor which is resectable, then you do surgery or ablation. However, if the tumor is unresectable with liver only or liver dominant disease, then cirsphias can be integrated into between the first line, second line or third line chemotherapies to try and improve the overall survival of patients with unresectable liver only or liver dominant metastatic colorectal disease. What about percutaneous tumor ablation? According to the BCLC classification, RF ablation is only recommended for very early stage HCC. However, in practice, the recommendation has been expanded to include all thermal and non-thermal ablative therapies. Here's an example of a microwave generator with the cable and the needle that will be inserted into the patient as was shown in the earlier video. We have cooling to keep the shaft cool so that there is minimal risk of skin burns. This is a RF generator. The RF system require the use of grounding pads to complete the circuit. And as always, they have different dimensions of the needles in terms of length and diameter. 
Now here's an example of a patient who had a tumor in the right lobe, which was treated with RF successfully. As mentioned, there is no strong comparative evidence supporting one ablative therapy over the other for bridging or downstaging patients with HCC. So this is an illustration. If you have a tumor up to the 3.5, centimeters you can ablate both these lesions successfully and in patients with recurrent hcc after surgery chemoembolization with rfa showed better disease-free survival than taste alone as a first-line local therapy as previously mentioned percutaneous ability therapies and trans arterial therapies can be combined for an advantages synergistic effect uh, it is uncertain whether thermal ablation should be done first or taste first because thermal ablation first increases the vascular permeability in a hyperemia surrounding the treatment region and therefore any residual tumor or satellite lesion could then be targeted with taste however taste or taste first decreases the vascular heat sink before rfa Meta-analysis has shown that transarterial RFA combined treatments increase overall survival rates when compared to RFA alone in HCCs larger than 3 cm and microwave plus taste has been shown to have excellent response rates in lesions up to 5 cm. Here's illustration. So if you have tumor which is 4.5 cm or 5 cm, you would do taste before you do your microwave. For any tumor up to 3 cm, you can just do a microwave straight. Now comparing clinical conditions favoring ablation or resection, conditions favoring ablation on a liver function is less important than for resection. Tumor sizes less than three centimeters up to five centimeters is possible. Multifocal disease favors ablation up to three nodules. Tumors localized centrally Nodules surrounded by a sufficient liver parenchyma and absence of vital structures. In obese patients, advanced age or concomitant disease, previous surgery of the upper abdomen, which makes surgical exploration more difficult, and no clinical decision to be taken from the pathology information. But this can be overcome by the use of biopsies prior to the thermal ablation. However, what is the conditions favoring resection? No tumor size is not limiting, but recurrence rate run parallel to tumor size. All nodules have to be removable within one operation. Generally, tumors localize peripherally, and those tumors proximal to vessels, bile ducts, and other vital structures, which may be damaged by the use of thermal ablation. And patients who are physically fit with the absence of relevant comorbidities no previous surgery and patients who are possible transplant candidates due to better assessment of risk profile. Cryotherapy. Uh, this has been repeatedly explored, has not been shown to have superiority and the overall level of confidence is lower than that for heat-based therapies. Here's an example of a patient with a tumor in the right lobe for which multiple probes have been inserted. And this is the ice pole, which is very clearly defined and visualized. And this is the post-treatment response. As was mentioned in the previous presentation, clinical decision-making is guided by an interdisciplinary tumor board, which involves the liver transplant program, hepatobiliary surgery, medical oncologists, pathologists, gastroenterologists, hepatologists, as well as the interventional radiologists, body radiologists, and a whole scope of other people. At this point, I'd like to introduce the concept of stage migration, where the therapeutic options offered to the patients depend on the stage at which the patient presents. And these follow a very linear and defined pathway with no options of moving left to right or right to left 
depending on the circumstances the patient presents with. Now, what's the problem with trace migration? Selecting the most favorable option, especially in sequential therapies across different disease stages, remains challenging. And therapeutic stratification of HCCs is conducted by imaging, clinical criteria, and extent of liver function, and these are either the BCLC, ECOP, or child PO stage. Stage migration allows moving to another treatment, generally the one that is associated with the subsequent stage, if the approach linked with the current stage proves to be unfeasible. It must be recognized that only 20% of HCC patients are initially suitable for curative treatment. And therapeutic hierarchy requires us to consider that the treatment decision should be dictated by the efficacy of each therapy with complete or partial independence from the tumor stage. This implies that the hierarchical utilization of a unique scale of therapies is developed according to the survival benefit observed in the clinical practice of expert center. And therapeutic hierarchy focuses on the therapeutic sequencing to contain the disease in the most successful manner. This is well illustrated in this diagram where tumor stage based on diameter, number of nodules, vascular invasion and metastases, and a functional score, which comes with the stages of A, B1, B2, B3, C, and D. And therapies are here, expected median survival in months. And across all tumor stages, disease stages, you have uh, expected median survival for best supportive care, systemic therapy, intra-arterial therapies, ablation, liver resection, and liver transplantation. So if we look at the stepwise multidisciplinary management of patients with HCC, for those patients who are amenable to surgical therapy like liver resection or liver transplantation, you have pre-operative assessment including liver function and friability. You can increase resectability by use of pathway embolization or yttrium, and which at the same time can disease control or downstage. And of course, you have new intraoperative techniques, including anatomical and non-anatomical resections, the use of intraoperative ultrasound, parenchymal sparing surgeries versus major hepatectomies, and the use of laparoscopic or robotic versus open surgery. For those patients who do not fit into the surgical therapies, then intervention can act as a bridge to transplant and resection. For those patients who are outside these criteria, then intervention and systemic therapies can be used for disease control and best supportive care and hospice for those who are not amenable to either local, regional, or systemic therapies. Just to quickly finish off, I'd just like to mention the use of TIPS, uh, and this is a procedure which is used to treat refractive ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, and variceal bleeding. And the goal of TIPS is to reduce portal pressure by creating a low resistant bypass conduit between the high resistant portal circulation and the systemic circulation. So this is what is done. This is your portal vein. These are your gastric varices. And this catheter has come from the hepatic vein through the liver parenchyma into the portal vein. And a new channel is created so that the blood is able to flow through a low resistance channel. And as you can see, this varices in the stomach have disappeared. The other technique of portal vein embolization, where a catheter is inserted into the portal vein through the skin, and the branches of the right portal vein are occluded by the use of either glue or coils, the objective of which is to cause hypertrophy of the liver. So here is a patient who has a tumor on the right lobe. The left lobe remnant liver is insufficient. 
this patient had a portal vein embolization and the remnant liver volume has increased from 470 milliliters to about 550 mils. I hope I have given you a broad overview of the tools available to the interventional radiologists in interventional oncology in the management of patients with liver cancer. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, interventional radiology, interventional oncology plays a critically important role in liver cancer patients and interventions can be immediately life-saving for those patients with complications. Thank you very much.